and welcome to the return of the Double Down episode of the Irish Inquiry. Uh, I'm your host, John Caulfield, and tonight I'm delighted to be joined by um, renowned activists and fellow content creators Rob DeSalle and Mick Brazel, also known as the Irish Git. Uh, many of you will certainly know the Irish Git from his uh, famous red pilling videos, which do the rounds consistently as of late. It seems almost on the daily now Mick is dropping these videos. And Rob from the We The People.ie's kind share free speech platform. Um, both guests and myself are actually part of We The People.ie, which is an independent free speech orientated platform actually set up by Stephen Delaney. And I'll be discussing with the lads in depth and detail the Stand Your Ground initiative, which was in response to the proposed right to housing 39th Amendment to the Constitution. We'll also be playing a particular focus upon the upcoming free, free speech festival occurring in Galway this weekend. And then discussing uh, and a wide array of any other talking points with, in, with regard to the troop movement and broader cohorts uh, of society at the moment. Um, I suppose, as we all know, that uh, things are quite quite surreal, uh, I think is the only phrase for what's occurring uh, in the world and in Ireland at this time. So there's so much to jump into. We could go from this, that and the other topics and it could be a very interactive discussion with the two lads. So just to kick it off, I might bring both of you in. Um, Rob, I might start with yourself and I'll ask you both this question, lads. How long have you actually been involved in the activism and scene in Ireland and how did you actually get involved? Uh, good question, I suppose. Um, I I'll give a little caveat to this because often when I answer this question, people think, oh, uh, Rob only woke up last November. But, but that's not the case. Um, probably 10, 12 years ago, uh, I was listening to a radio uh, show and they brought on Terry Lawton. And he's, he's a big climate change uh, uh, truther, you know, and climatechangeagenda.com is his site. Um, and he was telling people to look up at the chemtrails. And uh, I did. You know, they were trying to take the piss out of him on, on the radio show. and uh, But he, he actually got me, you know, and so I started investigating it. And, and that really opened my eyes. And then in 2016, when um, the Podesta files uh, came out, you know, with WikiLeaks, they, they hacked John Podesta's uh, emails and uh, basically in black and white showed that there was an elite pedophile ring uh, ruling <laughs> the world, basically. Uh, so that fully woke me up. Um, but then I suppose... I, I went through this this uh, this COVID business like like a lot of other people, um, trying to fight the injecty thing, you know, um, trying to fight the battle in the comment section, and you know, <laughs> I suppose these types of things, and having little success, and just just really being sort of, I guess we were all isolated in our own little way, and then the local nightclub was enforcing the the injecty passes on teenagers. And um, like my daughter's too young to go, you know, you know, to, to, to the teen disco. But uh, a lot of people, a lot of young people were being coerced into taking it. And, um, you know, there was uproar. There was outrage. There was parents phoning up that local nightclub, Toff's nightclub, and, uh, you know, pleading with them down the phone. Why are you doing this? You know, and uh, they laughed at, at the parents down the phone and told them to phone Stephen Delaney. And that's when, you know, we sort of said, I I don't care now. This is it. They're really, really going after our children, like you know. And um, it's 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 forced uh, jabby thing by coercive control. You know, it, that's mm -hmm. what it is. And um, so we went out and we protested. And uh, there was, you know, I remember saying, "God, if I'm the only person there, I don't care. I'm going to go down." If there's ten people, brilliant. And there was thirty people that day, and uh, it, it started a series of rallies. Um, throughout the Northwest, you know, Donegal and Sligo. And, uh, you know, at that time, all these people started coming out, you know, and making contact and, and supporting one another and helping each other. I got to know uh, Michael Brazil there as well, and he came and spoke in Sligo. And uh, th that's basically it. Once I realised that you can actually get out there and do something, you don't just have to sit and battle it out in the, <laughs> in the comment section. Mm. You know, you can actually make an impact. Um, there's no looking back. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, you, you obviously got involved. I remember when we, we did an interview about the Northwest Rising campaign. I think that was early January time. <laughs> things, things were very different in the nation at the moment, uh, which I'll actually touch upon in a second, kind of the change in the last six months. Uh, what about yourself, Mick? I know you've been doing videos for quite a period of time. Both of you have been involved in this a lot longer than myself, lads. Yeah, well, I suppose it was six or seven years ago now that I suppose you could call it waking up. I woke up um, to the things that were going on in the world and 
not it didn't hit me straight away. It took about two years. And then when my first child was born, I was standing at the door one morning. Um, there was a friend of mine on about um, geoengineering, and I was taking the piss out of him, laughing at him, jeering at him, as people do, saying he's mad. And he was saying this, that, and other. But I was at the door one morning having my coffee. I seen a plane going by. I seen it turn on a spray and turn it off further down. And I said, wait, wait, no, that's not physically possible. <laughs> unless they're spraying something. And I went from there looking into it and started speaking out more so on the geoengineering and the, and the 5G and the dangers of 5G. And it just went from there then. Yeah, that, that's quite interesting that geoengineering is both of your entry point into it, isn't it, really? When you consider the fact it's one of those ones for the for the so-called, for want of a better term, the so-called normie, that they just can't fathom or get their head around the fact that we're literally being yeah. sprayed by bugs. You know, it's interesting that that was both your opening, your your intros into it. Isn't it? Like, you, you know, I, I actually found that interesting, Mick, as well, when I heard that with, with yourself. But I, I think once you realise that they can do something so grand and yeah. uh, on one hand admit it, right, I, you know, and come out of the shadows and call it stratospheric aerosol injection. Uh, and when they call it that, you know, they, they can do a show, they can do a media release, and it's fine. But as soon as you use the wording uh, uh, chemtrails, it, it triggers a, an implanted uh, command that makes people <laughs> just eyes glaze, they shut off, they can't hear it. You know, and I thought, wow, like if it can happen on that scale and that level of sophistication, you know, mm. yeah, there's something and going it's, on. It, it, like, it's so insidious when you consider the fact, I know, like, and you know, maybe we might start on the chemtrails, as, as I said, this is an organic chat, but, you know, it's something which obviously it damages the food supply. It's even the claustrophobia. I don't know if you've noticed, like, it's actually a lovely clear day outside today. And I was actually embracing the clear air. I said, oh, my God, it actually doesn't feel as claustrophobic. You can actually feel the thickness in your breath. You know, you can it, it it's it does they're very much way heavy on you, and you can actually see how they dissipate. Like I follow them sometimes early here in the morning, and you can see maybe three or four. I know Rob, you were talking when I watched listen to your excellent podcast with Terry Lawton, and in England and the in the UK and in America, they're of military grade formation, whereas here it's more kind of sporadic. But it's still like it, within a half an hour, forty minutes after them spraying, it seems as though the sky is absolutely full. Yeah. 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 Right, we, before we get down, before we get stuck down the chemtrails, Pat, because that could take a show yeah. in and it. <laughs> we could see where that was going. Um, just, you actually, we were talking about January there, Rob, you know, when we did the interview previously, obviously when you were setting up the Northwest Rising, and this for both of you lads, you know, the restrictions were lifted on the 21st of January um, without any forewarning whatsoever. It seemed to come as a great surprise. And I think sometimes people forget, and recall, I was actually thinking about this today, if you recall the level of fear and hysteria that was actually within uh, the troop movement as such at that time, like when you consider the fact that we were actually concerned about camps, you know, that was something with the legislation that was uh, going through the doll. Uh, people, there was a lot of rhetoric and uh, concern with regards to what way this was actually going to go. Everyone was following it across Europe, across uh, Austria, I think, where they were actually having dividers within the supermarket lines in Italy. Like, I know, and it's still taking place all around the world. People seem to forget. I know in Canada, you can't actually leave the country at present if uh, if you don't have that thing in your arm, you know. So that's obviously six months ago. It's been an interesting six months, hasn't it, whereby I think a lot of people had to take a little bit of time to regroup having, you know, when there, there was a real push last winter, as you kind of expressed, especially when they were coming for the children. I think that's where the, you know, the sense of urgency really was instilled within the vast swaths of the troop movement. Um, but I suppose two kind of questions following on from that is, how do you perceive the kind of the sentiment of the, I suppose, the troop movement and general society at large, lads, over the course of the last six months? Because from what I understand or from my kind of perception of things, it would appear as though anti-establishment sentiment is hitting on fever pitch at the moment and most notably the cost of living crisis, which I know yourself, Rob, you did an article about that recently on the We The People.ie website. Um, just maybe your own observations or your understandings as to, you know, where that general sentiment and the, the, the general feeling about the place is at the moment. Yeah, sure. Um, see, I, I have a, th I have a bit of a theory, right? That um, the, the globalist puppet masters are preparing for a handover of government, um, and the current guys don't necessarily know that they're being hung out to dry. So, so they're backing up their points, 
right? Uh, you, you know, tenaciously, but th they're not necessarily aware that that there is just going to be a, a transition, a, a handover. And I think they've they've uh, primed us, primed society for that, for 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 uh, basically a handover of, of government to Sinn Fein, uh, people for profit, and and um, uh, probably some independence and stuff, some some radical left in independence. And I think um, they need. For that, they need a catalyst, and the real catalyst is one of the primary ones is property rights, and uh, but also the cost of living. So these things, these things were manufactured, it, it, you know, and it, it's the same thing. It's it, it's crisis uh, solution, and 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 you know, so they they manufactured the the, the virus, and like we know that, you know, and uh, and then there's the Hegelian, solution. Hegelian dialect, they call it, isn't it? Problem, reaction, solution. Problem reaction solution, and uh, it, it's the self same thing with the cost of living crisis. Um, like that has been manufactured, and you know it, these people, like Sinn Fein and people for profit, like they were pro lockdown, and and they were pro restrictions, and also you know they they failed us on the injecting uh, past thing, you know. So um, they they really really contributed to. To the to the environment that is that has caused what's going on, so you know th then they offer this uh, trendy solution, cost of living crisis, uh, and you know I I think we can all see by the by the turnout that they didn't really that they haven't really captured the <laughs> they haven't captured the public opinion because uh, because they failed the public at, at large, you know, and um, like when you. When you think of the scale of it, like wh where we went, you mentioned January, you know, and we were worried about we were worried about them coming to the door, uh, you know, the, like there was articles going around saying that um, the, a secret of Garda unit had been assigned to tackle anti injecty uh, demonstrations, you know, so like every single right that we had was being was being stolen from us, and and we, like we were also traumatized from that. But see how quickly it transitioned into this uh, Ukraine thing, you know? And, uh, like, I, I remember being on a site. I'm a painter, right? And, and I was on a site, and there was a plumber there, there was a plaster there, there was a chippy and a sparks, right? And we're all sitting down having a cup of tea. I didn't know these lads. And uh, this was about two or three days after the Russia-Ukraine thing. And they were saying, no, lads, don't buy it. Don't buy it. You know, there was just a pandemic, and then all of a sudden, World War Three. don't buy it. There's something up. And like these guys were all triple spiked, so yeah, I think it's too grotesque. I think it's too egregious, and uh, I don't think they have the majority of the people. But there is a large section. Let's call it maybe twenty percent, thirty percent, maybe, who wear the masks, who enforced the, the passes, uh, who scream at people in Aldi, and they have, in a sense, become reborn. Right, they, they have this new identity as, as the prison guards. It's the Stanford prison experiment playing out in real time. They've been reborn as this prison guard, and uh, everything being pulled away has left this ego identity unsupported. You know, and they can be very volatile. But as soon as those restrictions come back in again, which they've prepared us for, mm. those people are going to push straight to the front lines and enforce it. And then the media will point to them and say, look, we have public support. So we we, we have to organise ourselves here now. Yeah, interesting. You know? it might be, it'll be definitely be something we'll touch upon maybe towards the latter part of the show there, Rob. There's a lot of interesting points in how you kind of framed it and encapsulated it. I'd be very much um, sure. kind of in, in wholehearted agreement. <laughs> Um, just uh, maybe on that, Mick, what's um, any thoughts yourself with regards to how... Uh, just how the, the general the general mood of the country, the general mood of the nation. Yeah, I, I see a big change. Um now and that change isn't just online, but notably it's online where you look at the mainstream media articles, whether that be on Twitter or Facebook or whatever <laughs> social media, and all the reactions and all the comments were pro the with the, the narrative all be, for the last Ginny two years. But in the last few months, it's changed completely the opposite around. And the people that were speaking with the government and with the narrative, they're even afraid to speak out because they can be shut down in, in, in one or two sentences with, with straight out facts. And um, then the general population, I think a lot of people are in denial. 
and they're afraid. And that's understandable too, when um, mm. with we see going on around us. Um yeah, a lot of people there's a certain percentage of people then that are always going to be in denial and they're never going to admit that they were wrong and they want to continue this COVID and a lot of them continued with a lot of them are still continuing like like prison guards, as Rob said, is one way of putting it. I, I'd put it a bit stronger, stronger myself. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that that certain percentage will will never get on side. And mm-hmm. but the majority of people are changing their mind and changing the way they're viewing things. Um, and even the people that jumped on the Ukraine thing at the start of it, a lot of them now were saying, "Oh, hold on now a minute, this doesn't add up, or this doesn't add up." And, for 133 days, we've been told by the media that Russia is a depleted force and the Ukraine will win any day. Mm, <laughs> it's, no, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's laughable when you consider Russia as a nuclear force, you know. And even, yeah. you know, on, on the Ukraine issue as well, lads, like, a, like, and we've all seen, I presume a few of you, I haven't actually asked you this, I don't know if you've seen what happened in Kinnegad over the course of the last week where there was, you know, yeah. absolute uproar. Um, you might, I don't know if either one of yourselves, like basically my understanding of the situation, I was chatting with someone who was actually there, they said that there was 150 uh, military age men who were actually of Syrian descent, they weren't actually Ukrainian, and they know that because they had to have, there were so many incidents, there was a sexual ass- yeah. assault on a 14 year old girl, there was uh, robberies and theft of luggage coming in off the buses, uh, there was loitering, there was catcalling, there was general intimidation to the point at which there was actually people afraid to go down their own street, almost yeah. willing to, to, to take a, um, a hurl in their um, you know, in their pram with them. And there, the locals, there was absolute fourth uh, uproar. I, I, I've heard through the grapevine there was an emergency meeting occurred um, within the local GA club, and it was discussed with the local politician who then wrote a letter, I think, to Minister Roderick O'Gorman. But, you know, the dogs on the street know that this is absolutely part of a much broader agenda. And it would appear as though that there's more and more people, I would hope, that are not going to be as afraid of the, you know, the tip, the typical tarring and feathering of, oh, you're a racist, oh, that's, you know, the, you're not a humanitarian and whatnot. I'm a humanitarian as much as the next person, but we're a very small island with a small capacity to house, uh, we can't even house our own at this point, you know. Um, I don't, you know, and I would imagine that situation has probably been emulated across the country as well. I've heard of different instances down in Wexford. I don't know if you, you know, have anything to add to that or your own kind of take on it yeah i well i certainly do um yeah it's the same around here in the midlands all our small towns and villages are being uh, fed with all these fighting age men and um, they're mostly from georgia and nigeria so they're they're, they're not asylum seekers uh they're or refugees we're, we're being told they're asylum seekers and refugees that are coming here by definition they're not and um, they a lot of them seem to be single males between the age of 25 and 35 i actually done an interview for rte a few years back, outside the direct provision, it was proposed direct provision at the time in Tullamore, and I gave them an interview and I brought down all the data from Sweden and mainland Europe and how the the, <coughs> the open borders and <coughs> uh, policy had affected their countries and gave them a right yoke. Now they pled, they waited, they kept the footage for two years and then played 40 seconds of it on the prime time, the far right in Ireland, of course. <laughs> but um, now what they did Fair play to them. What they did put up the forty seconds, it was it was pretty scathing as well. But I'll stick to everything I've said about it from day one. Now the media are reporting on this. Just in the last few hours, they're saying oh, 60, pe- 60 men were moved to or sixty. They're not even saying men. They're saying sixty refugees were moved to Kinnegad. Um, don't, don't you know, yeah. Mick? There's no such thing as a man or a woman anymore these days. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that too. Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I identify I identify as a person that only identifies two genders, so I, I, I'm okay to say there's only oh, two yeah. genders. <laughs> you have to have a laugh about this or you lose your sanity in this world. The, yeah, the media are saying now there's 60, even though the politicians down there are saying there's 150. Now, mm. whether there was a big fight in the red cow there between between Ukrainians and Middle Easterns, whether it's them Middle Easterns that have been moved out or not, we have the NGOs and the government lackeys coming in and saying, oh, to the Kinnegad people, oh, don't let outsiders in on this. And we're not outsiders, number one, we're Irish citizens and we're concerned for our daughters or mothers or sisters. Number two, them 150 that's going to be dealt with is the 150 people are just going to be selected in small little groups and spread out into our towns. We don't know where any of these people are going. The problem is they're unscreened and unvetted. And people say, oh, we have Irish out far and everywhere and 
Yeah, my brother had to move to Australia. I've had loads of family move out. They were all vetted before they left. They all had to have a certain amount in their bank account and they didn't get anything handed to them on a plate when they got there. Mm. They had to work for everything they got. And yeah, we'll be called racist and we'll be called all right, we're talking about it and that's okay with that. I'm okay with that. I'm, I'll, I'll be actually putting out a video on the Kinney Gadge situation tomorrow. Um, I'm going to put I, I'm going to put a bit of humour in it, obviously. As, uh, some things you can and some things you can't, but I'm going to because I'm going to be talking about it seriously, but I'm going to be taking the skit about me being a racist. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Just to stop. Humour is actually really important. <laughs> on that subject and you know Rob I know that you've looked down this area before like in terms of the neuro-linguistic programming in the spell and it would appear as though that because people like you know you actually I was chatting to someone the other day about this I was actually it was Dan gone and I was saying we sometimes forget that the general population have actually been under a military grade psychological warfare for the last two years and the effect that that actually has in terms of keeping them in a trance and humor seems to be one of the best ways of just bypassing that and there's a reason why political correctness was introduced and f- hoisted and forced upon the Irish population, because we've always been known for our eloquence, for our wit and for our humour. And for for want of a better term, for our ability to rip the piss out of any situation, you know, for it to be subject to ridicule. Um, anyway, that that's, you know, somewhat off yeah. topic. I don't know if you want to touch on that, Rob, or even the general situation with regards to the so-called Ukraine crisis. But yeah, uh, interesting point. I mean... <laughs> words are weapons like you know and I, we are fighting a psychological war and uh we we owe it to, to ourselves that while it's still a psychological war we use all the available tools of, of psychological warfare and they're words you know um but there's a sort of thing about the magic of the bard and the jester you know that that the jester is more powerful than the king because he can remove a king or a kingdom with only his <laughs> words he can write a satire about people, and, and that's how mm. powerful it can be, you know. And um, but it I, on the on the on the whole, you're racist. You're not racist. It, it comes down to this, right? That if you look at uh, some of the teachings of Freemasonry, they they have the two pillars, right? And that's and apparently these pillars run through man, and the, the pillar of mercy and the pillar of severity. And if you take an issue like immigration and you look at it with too much mercy, uh, you're going to let in the wrong people you know you're going to let in some really 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 bad people and when you talk about unleaded they could have committed some of the most heinous crimes some really really egregious stuff they could be full-blooded and uh, and you know you you're letting them de- into our small little villages uh, around our teenage girls uh, uh, and, and and around our, our communities you know um, and if you look at the issue of immigration with too much severity you're going to betray your conscience because there are people who who were seeking refuge, who are fleeing war, and, and who need compassion. Mm-hmm. So it, it it's about balance, it, you know. And uh, the 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 government line on it is totally unbalanced. Like vetting process, you mentioned the vetting process, and and you're you're a racist, you know. Mm-hmm. There's no cap, you know. And uh, whenever the question about it, say, oh, government have been very clear, there will be no cap. Well, government have been very clear. That's a bit crazy, isn't it? You know, and like the, 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 there's a mass uh, operation to cover all this stuff. Like the, what happened to Kenny Gad was on the radio today, you know, and they said mm. that locals have spoken out and said that there aren't enough facilities to help these people. And I said to myself, that's not what they're saying in Kenny Gad. What they're saying in Kenny Gad is, is they're sexually abusing uh, people in our community and uh, we're terrified and they're terrorizing us and stealing off us. That's what they're saying in Kenny Gad. And we all know it. So, I mean, I, I guess the appeal would be to people in, in these areas, you know, reach out, who, who uh, you know, and start start uh, telling us what's going on so we can start pulling these stories together because uh, we need to use our words and we need to get out what's really happening because the government media are just going to smoke screen, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'd wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Mick. I'd just say the fact that, like, 
essentially the people like we're all three of us are just ordinary Joe Soaps. The, the people are the media now. That is absolute because the media has gone so like look, they were never really told the truth in the first place. It was always with hidden agendas. It's just become more transparent and clear. But to the point at which we're essentially living under a, an authoritarian regime, I think Miss the, the Helen McEntee as a minister for justice will probably go down. And someone mentioned this in uh, Luke mentioned it in our chat the other day, and he said that she'll probably go down as one of the worst ministers for justice within the history of the state, which I would wholeheartedly agree with and probably positioned there for that specific purpose to try up and you know the, the Irish population it's a it's a very pressing issue you know and one in which so many people has it's just it's a landmine for people not to discuss so again just to, to echo what Rob was saying about anybody who is listening who has local stories you know Ireland is a small place it's very parochial it's almost like a, a series of villages so stories can get out you know and they can kind of spread like wildfire quite quickly so just to encourage people to have the bravery I suppose to step outside their shell and once you do I think the three of us will recognize once you do step outside of that um it's actually very empowering and it's very liberating that you're not kind of constrained by kind of social factors such as isolation or ostracization you know um or, or, uh, Mick, do you have anything else just you want to add on that point i know it's obviously something you've discussed and you've done videos on and stuff like that just before and next i might want to move on to the stand your ground initiative as part of the we the people yeah no i'm um, i i pretty yeah people if we could encourage people, the more people we have speaking out, the better. And as you said, yeah, if, if you hear things going on in your local areas, put put the word out there in any way you can. Mm. Um, and it, it is getting out and people are starting to see what's happening. And unfortunately, it's going to take it's going to take some of our women in Ireland getting sexually abused or raped or murdered or men. It's going to happen. Uh, with, with unvetted and unscreened migration and we have to realise that and stop it and you're not racist for, for for even thinking that that's the right the right way to go like you know um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, look at it, it. Even says, it says it in the nineteen sixteen proclamation that that Ireland is owned by the Irish. You know, that's there in the Muslim historic document in the history of this I, nation. So. And could I just say, John, before we move on, that um, nationalism is the natural antidote to racism because racism does exist, right? It does mm. exist. But, like, you, you remember when we were kids and the St. Patrick's Day Parade and uh, you'd have your Indian people in their cultural garb and you'd have the, you know, Nigerian mm. people and you'd have all these different people from these different cultures celebrating Irish nationality. It, it It's a unifying thing, you know? Nice. It, it just, and, and it's been made to be, it's been called racism but it's actually the natural antidote to it well didn't leo Ver what did leo veredker say approximately one month ago he said that uh, as a result of the cost of living crisis and people not affording to be able to be able to afford their own, own their own homes people are actually resorting to populism nationalism and anti-eu sentiment that in itself should be treasonous like he's only there because we had nationalist people here a hundred years ago, you know. But I suppose, look, it's just indicative of the situation in which we're in. If you're not a globalist, if you're not a pro-establishment stooge, you're completely marginalised and tired and feathered or something that you're absolutely not. But sure, look, lads, we're, we're, we're well used to that at this point, aren't we? Um, I want to move on to the Stand Your Ground initiative, lads. Um, can you explain, I suppose, to the unaware audience um, what this initiative is all about? and how their rights to own private, private property are in jeopardy if this proposed amendment is not quashed by the people of Ireland. Either of you, by all means, whichever right. wants to jump <laughs> You take a bit. Yeah, well, the 39th Amendment to the Constitution has been sold as a right to housing bill, and it's going to be pushed by the usual, the, the well-funded NGOs and everything as an end to the homeless crisis and a right to housing for everybody. But in, in, if you read it, it says the state can delimit your right to private property. And it doesn't, property just doesn't mean your house either. But I just want to mention before I do get into the house part, Pro property, your property is the clothes you have on right now. Your property is your car. And the World Economic Forum are putting out videos every week telling you by 2030, you will own nothing and you will be happy. And this is a stepping stone to that. Mm -hmm. So the house thing, if, if if you read the wording of the amendment, if if I if my granny is living in her three-bedroom house on her own and she's lived there all her life, well, the common good, it might be for the common good that she's moved out with that and put into a granny flat and a family has given her House. And it doesn't have to be an Irish family or citizen. It says all residents of Ireland. Mm -hmm. 
we're getting a lot of new residents here to Ireland and we have a lot of people in Ireland that are homeless. There's over 10,000. That list is only going to grow with the cost of living crisis and and what's been put off for the last two or three years with the amount of court cases and properties that will be taken for unpaid mortgages and whatever. There's been a, an awful lot of cases postponed. So the, the homeless crisis is only going to worsen along with the, the cost of living crisis. And then they're coming in and trying to sell us sell us this bill as an end to the homeless crisis. That's what it's going to be sold as. And it's not. It is very, very nefarious is one word to say. Um, and I'd advise anyone to, to look it up. It's on the Eroctus website. Um, these leaflets have been done up and they're absolutely brilliant. Yeah, there's, there's 25,000 of them, I think, after being disseminated across the country, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, and um, there will be more, I'm sure, and it gives the links to everyone there with um, their old, um, QR codes and everything, so that so the normal general population will actually probably scan it and look at it. But um, they're very well done up, and it explains uh, an awful lot in the leaflet. And if if you can get your hands on them leaflets, um, I don't know if the person is out public or who who put them together, but uh, very well done, a great job as well. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I'd advise do. anyone, anyone that's listening, to go onto the Oireachtas website and look at the 39th Amendment to the Constitution and the wording in it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's it's very insidious. It's very nefarious. And I think I saw a quote before. I don't know who it's attributed towards, but it said like the first pillar of. I don't know if we're actually moving into communism or neo feudalism at this point. It's kind of hard to distinguish between the two. But it said the first pillar of communism is the abolition of private. <laughs> So I think that's why it's of such concern, considering the the restrictions on personal liberties and freedoms that have occurred over the last few years. The fact that it's moving directly, you know, there's a tread here for anybody who's following you. As I used to see, there's a genuine tread. And um, Rob, yourself, your your thoughts on the the stand your ground initiative? It's obviously it's it's a it's a very important one to try get out into the public ether and into the public psyche at the moment. Yeah. So John, for, first off, I love how you frame it, right? Because you say it's about property rights. Uh, they're saying it's about housing. It's not about housing. It's about property rights, you know. Yeah. And they're using mm-hmm. housing as as the painful issue to 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 coerce another right off us to to take our rights away, like you know. And stand your ground. It, 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 it's it's a catchphrase, right? It, 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 it it's a slogan, but it's think of it. Stand your ground. Your ground is your territory, right? But it's like it also extends to 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 your rights. Now we'll we, we'll come back to that. But the the initiative. There was a lot of public meetings. Like when we realized what was happening, uh, and, and and they were bringing this thing, there was a lot. We we started calling public meetings, and people just themselves in their own locality started public meetings. We we had two in Sligo. Obviously, uh, Mick had, had one in Burr in County Offaly. There, there was one up in Letter Kenny. They were in Kilkenny. They were in Galway. They were in Cork. Sword, they were all over swords. Dublin. They were in Swords, Dublin, swords yeah. League yeah. Slip, Kildare. They were literally all all over the country. And, uh, you know, what What we found was the reaction to it was was tenacious. You know, Antifa were coming out, they were, you know, phoning up bomb threats and stuff to places that, that were hosting them. And uh, when you see that happening, you're, you're, you're over the target. So, yeah. uh, so, so that got the ball rolling. And, you know, th- there are a bunch of, like, if you go on wethepeople.ie, you, you, you'll see there's a bunch of uh, proposed solutions to, to, the, mm. to the housing crisis, really. But, um, like... We, what we have to realize is this if this goes to a referendum it's going to be a battle of the minds and we're a little bit ahead of the game here like we, we mm. we've been fighting this information war in this particular sphere for for a little while and uh, we're, most people are totally oblivious to it and uh, be under no illusion um it, it it's not there to tackle vulture funds it, 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 we already have compulsive compulsory purchase orders to do that we already have case law we already have state commission reports that show that like private property of the individual does not impede social housing uh pvp came out and said like there's all these vacant homes all over the country we need to go out and seize them we need to use emergency powers and go out and do it like that's where they're going with it Mm. be under no illusion and that's is that, that I don't know if you know the emergency powered legislation that was introduced as a result of the the Health Act of the amended in 2020 from 1949. Is it a continuation? I don't know if either of you have the answer. To this is it a continuation of those emergency powers that they're proposing to utilize for to uh, to, to take over these dormant and derelict buildings? Don't know. 
Do you know? Do you no. have any idea, Mick? I don't. Or no, I don't. But I, no, I'm nearly sure it is the same. That, uh, but it was it was people before profit that were calling for it. Yeah. I don't think many people listen to them. <laughs> um, five, 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 five of them, wasn't it? Five of them that proposed it from people before bridge. Yeah, five, five, five of them. Yeah, as five of them. It is. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Five of them. You you were going to jump in there, Rob? The, Housing means nothing. A, a prisoner mm-hmm. is housed. Right. Mm-hmm. What what we what we need is homes. People need homes, you know. So, uh, like, they, they, these guys have presided over the housing crisis. They've nurtured it. They've made and it worse it's, and worse. I think it's as well as any other manufacturer. It, every crisis that we appear to have in the country is a manufactured crisis. And one of the, the more insidious things that they would appear to have done is that they've tapped into the disillusionment and the despair of, say, that maybe you're talking the 27 to... 40 kind of cohorts maybe 25 to, to 25 to 40 25 to 30 to late 30s who can't afford a home and um, who many of which are actually they're uh, delaying actually starting a family as a result of the fact that they can't even the rent costs are actually through the roof and they actually can't have somewhere to build their fort you know to build their you know back whatever however many years ago i think in 1993 the average price of a home was maybe 25 to 30 thousand pounds I, I stand to be corrected but somewhere within that region and then you see the likes of Sinn Féin who've put absolute emphasis and focus upon both housing and healthcare to absolute manufactured crisis, trying to hijack that and then trying to also be, be, you know, tie it in with what we would colloquially know as wokeism, you know, tap into the wokeism, the the third level educated, the indoctrinated cohort who don't know any better. And the the general, what I glean now, I don't know if you have any differing thoughts or whatever your thoughts are on it, um, is that those people's response when you describe to them what Sinn Féin actually is and how that could invariably be many, many times worse if indeed they ever did get into government is that they say, well, look, sure, they can't be worse. They're, they're worth a shot. But it's quite clear, I think, to anybody who has eyes to see that um, they're political opportunists and dangerous, dangerous Marxists. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you want to take, do you want to jump in there, Rick? You're itching to go. I'm I, 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 there wasn't no, even no, a question no. in that. I think I, 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 I bully Sinn Féin too much. I'd let you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're going to be in trouble soon, Nick. You're, you're, you're doing videos almost on the daily, taking ripping the piss out of Sinn Féin. And too late, it needs, it needs to be done. It if they get in and put in these, H, they'll put in these HPs, HP laws straight away and I'll be gone. I'll be one of the first gone. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, like, it, it pains me a little bit to say this because uh, I, I'm a Republican at heart. You know, my, my great-grandfather was killed at the GPO, <laughs> Jack Saul. And um, so it... it, it Republicanism is, is in my blood, but these guys have sold us to Europe. They've just they've just handed it, ha- handed handed our sovereignty to Europe, mm-hmm. and uh, th- they'll continue to do. Like I wrote an article about it, and I said they were so desperate for a united Ireland, they they would give our sovereignty to Europe. Um, you know, but uh, some people reckon it's it's not about that at all. It's not about that at all. They don't really want a united Ireland, but. Look, you, you, you just gotta you gotta know them by their fruits. What did they yeah. do, and what did yeah. they not do? Were they there for us? <laughs> they failed us, guys. They absolutely failed us. And they they entered a a, a vote pairing pact with uh, with the current government that that allowed that uh, egregious legislation to go ahead. So. Yeah. I'd, li- I'd like to think I would like to think that most of our uh, viewership anyway would be people who would uh, wouldn't be supporters of Sinn Féin at this moment in time I think anybody who has their eyes open to the, the COVID fiasco and great lie that they'd uh, recognise that you know all, all governments are corporations and all of them, none of them are sovereign you know sovereign for the people um, I think that will become transparently clear over the course of the next number of years. Um, just on the public meetings, you mentioned it, uh, Rob, and I, I think we were, I, I remember, I think it was back in February, I saw Stephen Delaney did a voice message which did the rounds all over the place. It was shared maybe 20 or 30,000 times across Telegram, uh, kickstarting it in Kilkenny and um, the private, pro- the, the actual public meetings. And it seemed like a natural evolution of the protest movement. You know, we had the whole the line events, we had the uh, then we had the public meetings, um, which were, it was a great way of actually penetrating the public consciousness because where did, and I remember one of the guys made reference to this in Swords, he said, where was the natural meeting point, particularly of Irish men? It was in the pub. So it was actually, you know, high, you, and, you know, we could use clubhouse and whatnot, but 
Um, you mentioned there's been what over ten or more public meetings. Um, what was your and maybe Mick, you want to comment on this as well by all means? Your general kind of sense as towards the the efficacy and the effectiveness of these public meetings in terms of I suppose trying to mobilise and galvanise um, anti-government uh, kind of sentiment. Do you want to go ahead, Mike? Yeah, well, um, I called the one in Border for the square in Border mm. just because all the venues, as as Rob said, were cancelling and they were getting threats. So they were they were they were cancelling and not letting us to 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 let the public meetings take part there. And I said, look, if they're going to play that game, we'll just do it out on the street. We'll encourage people to do it out on the street. If if you look up about the Thirty Ninth Amendment and you you read into it, I, I'd encourage you yourself in your own local area. To call a public meeting, start to inform people. Um, it, yeah, st- st- you have to stand your ground basically because, uh, and we mm-hmm. are ahead of the game on this one. And the public support was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it because I'm that I'm that mad conspiracy theorist that people are unsure about. You know what I mean? And and but but when it come to the when it came to the housing issue, and and I called it on the turf as well because I wanted mm. to get into some of the science on the turf as well and let people know how. How outrageous the turf ban is! Like, and uh, proposed turf ban. They keep saying, "Oh, it was proposed. It's gone, gone away. It's not going away. It's coming back." The the uh, banned on online sale of turf is is to, it's banned from tomorrow. I think. Is it? So they are. Yeah, wow. they are going ahead with it. Like you know, so head scratch. They, they, they really, they really touched a nerve with the turf, didn't they? They really touched a nerve. Yeah, like our, our our ancestors warmed themselves with with turf, and um, through the hard winters, they cooked their food with the turf. They, we wouldn't be here without them, with and we, they wouldn't be here without the turf. And it's, it's been a big part of our economy, in your part, especially in your yeah. part of the world as well, Mick. I know it, often, it, you know, it's very dependent upon us. A, a, a huge part of the economy for at least a hundred years, mm. and then they want to make it disappear under the under the guise of a. Uh, climate change or and for their carbon neutral future and all and it can be broken down very easily and broken apart but then again mm. that's why there's no debate even allowed on it because when they're screaming the science is settled it's far from settled mm. and um, they don't want people knowing that or you know you can't you know yourself you can't talk about anything that's against the narrative um, climate change and the science is, is a very big thing that you're not you're not allowed to talk about yeah, I think I think climate change should be um, definitely one. It'll require a show in and of itself. Um, I just see a comment there actually from Stephen Blaney on YouTube. He says he'll be doing another meeting soon, so look forward to that. Um, I think yeah, climate change will definitely require a show in and of itself. Which I'd love to, you know, get the likes of Terry Lawton and them on. That's because it's it, it would appear, you know, as to whether they're going to use climate lockdowns. That's what all of this, the, you know, the taxation, the, the the amount of taxes that's on, even the, the cost of fuel. Um, it, it's a very important issue, and it's one in which I still don't think it's captured the minds of people the way COVID caught people off guard. It's more a lot of people don't realise how it, they're actually using that to affect policy to increase top-down governance, centralise, you know, it's quite obvious the elites are trying to centralise and consolidate all of the assets and resources of society. It's a neo-feudalism. That's why they're buying up all resources and assets. They fully anticipate, like we do ourselves, that the fiat currency financial system is going to collapse. So they want to have all the resources bought in place. And the, the, it seems like climate, climate change is just a, it's a key to that door, you know, it's, it's a very important key to open up that door of top-down governance. Um, I just want to move on to this weekend, lads, so with Galway. Um, obviously, this weekend, Rob and Mick, do you want to let the people know as to what's happening? It's a, a two-day event, so we're hoping that people will come for the whole weekend and enjoy it. Do you want to let people know what the crack is? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, th- there'll be some great speakers there, you know, Dr. Vincent Carroll and, and a whole host more. You know, we have to release a, a, a final lineup. It'll, it'll probably come out tomorrow. Um, but more importantly, the mic is open. And mm. uh, th- that's the thing, you know, like, I, I, I think we have to realize uh, wh- where we are and, and where we're going. I, I, I just want to preface this uh, a, a little bit, right? Because there. <laughs> We're about to enter another phase come autumn time, right? Um, you know, they've laid the foundation for this. They told us back in January that there would be uh, further restrictions uh, in the autumn and winter time. They also said there would be uh, further uh, programs. Uh, and where are they going to record that? They're going to record that on the QR code. So that path.
that system thing hasn't gone away. It's just been suspended. And it's going to be reintroduced very soon. And so they said that back in January, and now in the last couple of weeks, they're ramping up that rhetoric. You know, th they're nurturing those seeds they planted back there and get prepping people for it, getting them ready for it. So that is coming. And uh, this truth movement, like I hate that term, right? But you have to use the term. It's splintered into factions. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of different conflict, you know. Pe some people don't believe it exists at all. Some people do. And, you know, th there's conflict between those people. Um, there's a lot of religious conflict across the movement. Um, there's a lot of sectarianism. There's um, th there's all these different points of conflict. And what people have to realize is we're going to have to lay those things down mm. temporarily. Temporarily. Mm. I'm not saying we all have to become the same. You know, they're, they're, they're our beautiful individualities, but we're going to have find, to lay them down. Find, find our commonality, Rob. Find our commonality. Yeah, yeah and be able to cooperate on things because mm. uh, I think we're going to need some, some serious action, some serious uh, cooperative action. And uh, Galway is a, is, is a place where the mic is going to be open. You know, there, there, there's people there who are going to be coming up and speaking who might not necessarily agree with each other, but we have to get those opinions out there. We have to find what's being censored and get it out there by the power of the spoken word. You know, um, that's, that's, what I got, that's what I got to say. Galway, Saturday from 12 to 6 and Sunday from uh, 12 to 3. Yeah, absolutely. The music, the music, I only was a lot Galway, of things going on. Galway last year uh, on the I think it was the twelfth of July. It was uh, it was an excellent day, um, and I believe, I think the weather is promising to be good as well this weekend, lads. Am I not, am I mistaken in saying that? Uh, I don't know if any of you have had time to look yeah. up the weather. Here was. That, that, that always attracts, that always attracts a decent crowd. Uh, and Mick, yourself, you're part of the the organising committee as well. What is it that you're hoping that's kind of achieved from the festival? I'm part of the organising committee, but uh, Rob will tell you now I didn't do much. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just look, uh, yeah, it's just getting other people up there, and I see I see a few socialist party from Galway and this are on about counter protesting, as if it's a protest. That's grand. I hope they're there because I'll invite them up and hand them the mic mm. and say, "Well, oh, let's do it here and let's see what goes on." Now, whether I don't think they will, but uh, they need to be challenged as well. These people, but then. We we will hear. From, I'll hear from people that I don't agree with. I hear from people I don't agree with the whole time, and that's in the truth movement as well. Um, like said, the twelve of us now, when the when we the people that we we won't agree on everything, but we we yeah. all come to consensus, and we're we're fairly we're fairly down the line on on what needs needs to be achieved and done and mm. on a lot of things, but we won't we won't agree on a lot. Um, I suppose there could be religious. People talking about religion down there. I don't know. I, I I try and stay away from that as much as I can. Anything, I stay away from everything. I'm kind of apolitical as well at, at the minute. Like I just mm. it's, it's failed us. So I I don't know. I'll I'll probably it depends if they're there. I don't know if I, I, everyone's heard the data and the stats. I don't want to be preaching to the crowd. So I might go up and use the free speech for uh, just to take the piss. <laughs> yeah, oh, we need a bit. Of we need a bit of comedy. Mick. I might actually just make a point on that myself as well, lads. You know, um, within the movement, there's there's definitely um, a lot of bickering factions. Um, I think there's sometimes there's a lot of ego. There's people who uh, are unwilling to work with people of diametrically opposed viewpoints because it contradicts their own sense of self, regardless of the fact that their different viewpoints have nothing to do with what it is that they may uh, be fighting upon. I'd also go as far as say that there's quite a lot of paranoia. Uh, there, we're dealing with there, there is a lot of paranoia there's a lot of people who have and I don't mean to say this with any kind of condemnation or judgment towards those people but they've replaced the fear porn of the likes of RT for the likes of the absolute black pilling that you see on certain telegram channels and they've become consumptionists of content and consumptionists of fear and Rob you know me and you have discussed this at length how this is an absolute spiritual war they try to hijack your energies and that's actually feeding energy to the beast system you know where there's people just completely embroiled in this absolute state of fear I, I've definitely had that kind of aha light bulb moment over the course of the last couple of months that fear is their absolute greatest weapon 
Um, it's their like yeah. money. Money is their mechanism of control, but fear is their genuine greatest weapon. You know, but uh, look, that's just my general observations uh, for you know in terms of people who are obviously online quite a lot to try get offline a bit more, um, as much as for their own sanity as anything else. Because if you're exposed to that kind of content, the worst of the worst on a 12, 10, 11, 12 hour basis, in which some people are, it's really not good for the mind. You know, and it it yeah. just it, it creates this state of uncertainty. Um, I don't yeah. know if any want to add add anything to that. Well, well, well yeah, you, you know, I, I, a lot of people do recognise it uh, as a spiritual war, but just in terms of just in terms of energies, right? There's there's a uh, there's two really substantive energies, and one in the positive and one in the negative, and and uh, faith. Uh, it's a very substantive energy. Faith is described as the substance of things unseen. And um, what I would recommend is faith in the truth. Because most people who go out to speak the truth are going to come under attack. But, you know, this this phrase, you stand in your truth. Well, that requires a bit of faith. That you have to have faith. That if you are speaking the truth, and it's being led by your conscience, that that you're going, things are going to be all right. Like you know, unknown mm. friends will will come out. Will will, will come out, and uh, and it's a rallying call. Um, and fear is a very substantive energy. There's um th there's a guy online. He's long since passed. He was a, a decommissioned thirty third degree mason called Manly Palmer Hall, and he has hours and hours of lectures on YouTube. Really interesting stuff, right? Uh, and one of the things he said is, if you ever see a ghost, don't run. Because fear breeds substance into the entity. So fear is a substantive. It substantiates what's in front of you. And we've all seen that. Mm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just a, just a thought I'd, I'd like to share with you. Very interesting. That's, I, love, I love those little kind of nuggets of wisdom. Um, so that actually, I suppose that kind of dovetails somewhat with my... In my what I'm going to do, lads, is I'm going to ask one more kind of general question. And then I have one question specific for each of you, um, kind of just in regards to your own kind of background and your own kind of niche area. Um, so at present, there are... Like, the way I perceive it anyway, again, correct me if I'm wrong, at a present there does appear to be a natural coalescence of different agendas which are implemented by corporate governments at the behest of the parasitic elites. Um, for individuals who are embroiled in the fear or the sense of doom, or for those people who are, for want of a better term, newly awakening and coming out of that fear state trance, what would you suggest for them to take personal action, thereby disempowering those trying to infringe upon their sovereignty and even their sanity. I, I know that's a bit of a word for a, a bit of a a word salad, but you know, you get the general drift. What personal action can people take to actually step into their own power and step into their own sovereignty? Any bits of wisdom or advice that you may be able to offer, lads? I'd say just stop being afraid of what your neighbour or the stranger down the road might think of you. Um, stop being afraid of what family might think of you and just go and do it. Spread the word. Start with family if you have to. Friends, it'll it'll spread. Put out content mm -hmm. if you can. It's just the more the more people now at it, the better. And um, we can see that turn. And I just think it's going to grow with more people and more people. But um, yeah, I'd 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 advise people not to worry about what people think of them. But that's a big problem in in, in Ireland, especially. I I see and I I believe. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, no, I'd agree I, with that. I, I'm blessed in the fact that I don't really care what anyone thinks of me. <laughs> you know, and yeah. that's how that's how I sleep cozy at night, you know. So and it's, 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 it, you know, isn't it very liberating, Nick, to be honest? Me and you chat about this before. It's very liberating when you actually don't care and when you speak what's genuinely true in your mind and you're not trying to appease family, friends, colleagues, whatever it might be. It's very liberating to just speak your mind absolutely openly. You know, I, that's something I would love more people to actually experience that liberation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it absolutely is. But now, and they're put off a lot as well. Mm. Um, you, you're targeted if you speak out, um, whether that be with anti words or weapons or whatever. You know yourself, to, yeah, mm. anti. To say they're anti-fascist, but they're they're really just communists that will that will put up with fascist tyranny to get where they want to get. It's it's that simple, like, you know. They're, they're Fantifa, fascist, anti-fascist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's an that's an oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, Rob, yourself, anything you want to add about people, um, you know, yeah. taking a greater degree of personal action? Yeah, so a um, uh, couple of ideas. Um, I suppose one of them is to be aware of your own programming, you know, um, because and one of the main one of the main things is, 
it's social media, and I'm a little bit hypocritical here, but it, it, it's only by no by being aware of my own programming that 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 I'm I'm recommending this to people. Be aware of when you're scrolling on that news feed. You know, I think a lot of us have become can easily be headline uh, news readers, you know? And I, I, I found myself saying something to, something to somebody one time, oh yeah, I read an article about that. And I didn't read the article, I had a bloody bog about it. I just read a headline and I thought I had some knowledge about it. So just be aware of how you're, of how you're being programmed because you internalize it. Um, but the other thing I suppose is, is self-censorship. Um, and again, we're being very, I'm being a bit of a hypocrite here because we've been saying the old thing you put in the arm thing, you know, but obviously we're on YouTube and stuff, so we have to do it to a degree. Um, but be aware, the, the greatest form of censorship is self-censorship. And, uh, you know, so try not to protect people from the truth, you know. And uh, the final thing I would say is this hold the line, you, you mentioned hold the line earlier. Um, <laughs> these, guys, these guys are doing heroic work. Like, if you think of the power of subliminal mission, they're all over the country. Nearly every town mm. in Ireland, these guys mm. have shown up, and they shoot. They showed up with uh, yourself in in Burren County, Offaly. They're the yellow signs, you know. They're, they're not that confrontational, you know. But 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 they think they're they're the writing is things to get people to think, to plant seeds, and they're really going after that middle ground. The, the, yeah. the people who are driving by, you know, often master up. They're really. And uh, the level of information they're getting out there is, is it's, it's reaching fever pitch. They're literally all over the country. Um, and uh, I, I would say that, it, you know, if you're newly woken up and you want to actually do something that, that's incredibly powerful, nobody, nobody can stop you. And if there isn't one in your local area, which they're, they're actually all over the place, um, reach out and, 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 and we'll help you start one. You know, you'd be surprised yeah, how many people are, are around wants to do something practical. And, and stay out of the comment people, section. Sorry? Sorry for interrupting you there, Rob. I was just saying, if people want to know, if they want to reach out to some of the organisers of Hold the Line, they can actually find it on sovereignpeople.ie. They can actually, there's a there's a box within that for people to reach out, yeah. just to let the audience know, that's all. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That That's it. You know, they're, they're not that difficult to, to, to get started. So it's just one practical way, you know, but uh, just the power of the word, keep speaking the truth, that's it. Yeah, and you know, well, one thing you mentioned there, which actually had deep resonance for myself, Rob, because I've been, like, you know, I've chatted to you about this for uh, the last year or so, and it, it, what's really dawned upon me uh, as of late is the, the susceptibility and the potential programmability of the human brain. It's the most programmable thing to the extent to which I believe, like, I still, I know I personally have a lot of deprogramming still to do, programs that you've learned from a very, very young age when it was very subtle. Um, and I think in the, the new world that's being created, I think we all need that kind of cathartic healing and that kind of purging of what's not actually useful for our soul anymore. And to really recognize where there's actually programming that's deeply, deeply embedded into your subconsciousness, you know. Yeah. So I, I think that's something for each of us personally to to recognize and to try to work on, you know, it's, it's a very important action point. Well, well John, uh, for you and the, for you and the viewers at home, think of a pink cat. Think of it. Can't now, think of anything. Yeah. Well, you can't think of anything but a pink cat, but here's the thing. Did you have any choice in that? What if you didn't, what if you really, really didn't want to think of a pink cat? What if that was your worst thing to think about? You had no mm. choice in the matter. That's how powerful words are. Right. And so, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, take that and be aware of the things you're saying to yourself, because yep. if, I, I, if I can force you to think of, of a big red bus going by in your head, if I could force you to do that, uh, how power, how much do you listen to yourself? How powerful yep. are the things you're telling yourself, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Whole, wholeheartedly echo that sentiment, Rob. Um, so, lads, towards the, we're into the latter part of the, the interview, just... Uh, Rob, I'll go to yourself with this first. I have one question, as I said, for each of you. So, uh, and it, this is actually quite a long one. So, I might read this directly as opposed to kind of, uh, you know, take the synopsis. So, uh, you made a point recently, Rob, in our We the People committee chat, in which you mentioned that um, the powers that be are psychologically preparing their subjects for the reintroduction of restrictions vis a vis the ratcheting up of the fear porn and whatnot. And we best be prepared to resist and protest at all costs. Can you expand upon this and perhaps appeal to the other leaders within the movement about how we can be actually more organized and prepared should that eventual scenario come to fruition? 
Yeah, well, like we we we, we have to start coming to the table, um, and like Galway is a bit of a free speech project. Like it, 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 the mic is open, you know. Um, let, let's come together and let's talk. Like, I'm sure, we have some differences, but let's hash them out because they they are preparing us for that, and they laid those foundations in the past. Okay, and um, you, you know, we really have to realize that the the grave situation that we're in. Um, I think they're they're possibly there's a number of different balls in the air. They really are preparing for that handover to to, to the shinners. Um, but like, if you think of, for example, it's a bit, bit of a detour, but um, the the legal challenges to to the to the restriction legislation, there's been a bunch of them going. You know, you have G uh, Gemma and John Waters. You know, you have um, Melissa Kelly, and you have. Uh, 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 Tracy O'Mahony and you know and the, there are others I can't quite think of them but there's a number and we've always supposed that surely they have to let one of those go ahead right because all the all the restrictions were uh, unconstitutional and you know they're all sound arguments that are being made um, but then if you look at the way the response the way the, uh, they, they dismissed um, Gemma O'Doherty and John Waters uh, case there recently and the the psychological gymnastics they'd have to they had to go through these guys are in it for the kill so um like wh when they're going and they're reintroducing that pass system right and all the people who have had three or four and are highly susceptible and are really ill like it's already happening like it's already happening look at your communities the people who are especially the ones who've had three and four are getting very sick. They, you know, they're getting multiple uh, flus, three and four flus uh, consecutively, one after another, after another. And uh, when the winter comes, there's going to be a hell of a lot of people sick. So the fear that's going to be out there in society is going to be rampant. And we're going to need something really, really serious to fight against it. We don't know what that is yet, but we're going to have to come together. We're going to have to put things down temporarily in order to take down the Leviathan because it's coming for all of us. It's coming for our children and it's coming for our parents and it's coming for our, for our kinsmen. So that's it. I don't know. Did, did we lose John? Yeah, we might have had actually. Oh dear. Uh, this says, this says, this says we're live. So yeah. Oh, I think we lost Sean, though. I think oh, he might be back there in a minute, I'd say, hopefully. Really. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here he is now again. Have yeah, a message from Steve. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that, lads. I thought I didn't realise that was me. My internet just went there out of nowhere. No, no doubt he held out anyway. I know Rob's gone. Are you, can you hear me, mate? I can hear you there now, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, I don't know. I, I think we're just towards the latter part. I, I don't know if Rob. Um, I don't know if he's still there. If I, I don't know if he got to. Did he get to finish that question? Uh, probably. Where he just kind of was he kind of finishing yeah, that he answer? Yeah, he was just finishing up. I think as you come back. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, look. I, I might move on to then just to find to close up the interview. Uh, Mick, I might ask the final question of yourself. So essentially, look. Um, Nick, you're dropping excellent videos. I've seen even your viewership um, on your Telegram channel is kind of, it's going up fairly, very steadily. Um, and almost, actually, no, steadily isn't even the right word, quite rapidly, I would say, um, on your Telegram channel. And I think it's due to the quality, the the size of the videos that you do. You know, they're excellent. People can download them and then share them across all different platforms. You obviously give a lot of thought and research. I, I, I know you do. Um just from your own experience of being very outspoken and obviously very visible, um, is there any words of encouragement you'd have for those considering taking the plunge and adding their weight to the battle in terms of the actual social media side of things? Because you seem to have quite a, a very specific niche role. And, you know, I know about your motivations in terms of doing this. It's just for your children's future. But for anybody who maybe wants to take on a, a similar kind of a role, do you have any kind of words of encouragement for them? Yeah, I suppose uh, different things work for different people. But in this day and age, we see the youth and they are on a social platform and they're clicking on the net in 20 seconds, 50 seconds. And it's just getting on, on got so low these days. They're flicking, flicking. So I just realized very quickly that okay, I need 
my videos to be as short as possible, filled with facts, and then meme like with a bit of humor because that will catch more people. And, and I thought I, I really put it down to as well. I knew people wouldn't like me for speaking out, but I said if I could get a balance of the amount of people that hate me and the amount of people that actually like me, the message will travel further as well, which which does happen. And as I, I said earlier, I'm blessed and I don't I don't really care what anyone thinks of me. So not, not like that, it's going to stand in the way. I understand some people have different things like mortgages and jobs and they just can't risk speaking out or putting their face out. But you don't have to. You can put out content without without anyone knowing who it is. There's ways around everything, and I'd encourage anyone that, that can speak up to do so. And because now is the time, now, now is where we're going to we need as many people as possible. Um, yeah, yeah, and if you can keep it short and sweet, with a bit of humor, I think that'll that's very effective. It's it look, it's very effective for me as, as we can see there in that So, and yeah. there, I, I put low enough quality videos. Um, I lower the frames on them just because they're easier to download off Telegram and people can put them up on their social media it's easier. So, excellent, that's, excellent. That's keep, keep, keep. Great stuff, Mick. Um, keep doing what you're doing yourself and Rob. And uh, listen, lads, thanks very much for uh, your time here this evening. I look forward to meeting you in Galway on Saturday. Um, you, you have another point you want to finalise there, Mick? I think I see you jumping in. I do. I just, want to, I just want to say before I go, I'm a big fan of the Irish Inquiry, uh, particularly uh, Stephen Kerr and, and the work he does out on the street door seven politicians. And I'm, I'm a very big fan. And you can send people in the direction of the Irish Inquiry if you need people to be woken up to what's going on and different things. They're absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I, I'd echo that towards uh, Steve Kerr as well. Uh, I know Steve doesn't like the, the limelight now. He's probably sitting here in the background and he's shaking his head. But uh, there's not yeah. many better people at confronting the establishment stooges on the street. And um, we've all absolutely. seen some of the videos as a late. So I must definitely put that on it. Rob, how are you? We got caught off. We got caught off. And, and how is the order and the situations that he does be put in and different things? It's, it's a testament to him. That's, that's the truth now. Yeah, I'd be in agreement with that. Right, lads, we might close up so there. Um, just to reiterate, to rehash for people uh, in case they've forgotten. So make your way. I hope a sizable proportion of the people listening to this can make their way to Galway for 12 p.m. in Air Square uh, this Saturday and then that will be going on most of the day and then at 12 p.m. on Sunday in Air Square as well. Uh, to remind people of some of those websites that we mentioned, you can find a lot of information regarding the whole the lines on sovereignpeople.ie and information with regarding the Stand Your Ground campaign on we the people.ie as well as the Kind Sayer uh, podcast which both myself and Rob and Mick have all been on at different times so with that uh, we'll let you go uh, thank you very much for joining us and we will see you again shortly for another episode of Double Down on the Irish Inquiry <laughs>